Hi, I'm Chris Shaffrey, the president of the AANS, and I want to invite you to Boston for our annual meeting, which is going to be held on April 25th through 29th, 2020. The theme of the meeting is the world of neurosurgery. It's going to be an exciting, informative, compelling meeting, and I strongly encourage you all to attend. Welcome to the Nurse Surgery Podcast. I'm Mike Wang, and I'm here with my co-host, J.P. Colt. We are here to discuss all things neurosurgical. Hi, this is J.P. Colson, a resident in neurosurgery at Rush University. Please note that this is not a CME event, and the opinions and statements made in this podcast do not reflect those of any institution or professional organization. Now, let's get started. We're live. Great. I'm so honored to be joined uh, by... Jim Rutka. Jim is the chair of neurosurgery at University of Toronto. He's a uh, storied physician who's an expert in pediatric neurosurgery. But today we're going to be talking about his, uh, his secondary role, if I could call it that, which is that he's the editor of the White Journal, also known as the Journal of Neurosurgery. Jim, welcome to the podcast. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, JP. Great to be here. Yeah, so, so um, I kind of wanted to explore this area, which is so central to our, our work in academics, which is publications, peer-reviewed publications. And of course, you know, there are two principal journals in our field and, and you're the editor of one of them. And I want to get a little deeper into what that process is like. So a lot of folks are trying to write papers, get them published. I've gotten lots of rejections. Like, like what kind of process is going on nowadays in terms of submitting to the Journal of Neurosurgery? Oh, thanks, Mike. And don't worry, I've had a lot of rejections myself over the years. <laughs> but it hopefully is a lesson for all of us when you receive news that may not be good news from the journals. You hope to improve the works that you're trying to publish. And so what what are we looking for at the Journal of Neurosurgery? We're looking for the best science. We're looking for the best uh, clinical reviews, best papers, best case reports, and very high standards. Uh, I would say the acceptance rate for the journals, if you look across all the print journals, varies from 18 to 30% depending on if it's JNS PEDS or Spine or, or the main journal. So it's a highly competitive process. No so I feel better that. now. <laughs> yeah, feel, feel better about that. And for Spine in particular, Mike, as, as you know, it's about 20%. So it's still a very uh, rigorous competition to get your papers published in the Journal of Neurosurgery. So two-thirds to four-fifths of the papers that come through your office end up not making it into the Journal of Neurosurgery. Correct. Is that right? Okay. On average, we get about... 5,000 submissions, maybe more than that, a year. That's a lot of volume of material that comes my way. Up front, uh, Doug Konziolka, who's the associate editor, and myself, we reject about a third of those manuscripts up front. So wow. We do a triage. We look at the papers. And for reasons which we explain to the authors, we, we basically tell them that, you know, unfortunately, these are the reasons why your manuscript's not going to make it... Uh, for peer review, and this is why we can't publish your journal as it is. And we usually give instructions to the authors so they can improve upon their work, either by sending it to another journal, or if it looks like they can do some work to send it back into the journal, we'll let them know. But but basically, this is a triage mechanism for us. What's the most common, I mean, you look at paper, and what's the most common mistake people make when they're sending their manuscripts in? Uh, The uh, conclusions that they make don't fit the data that's presented. In Mm -hmm. other words, they're they're blowing up out of proportion what the, the final meaning is of the paper that is not substantiated by the record, by the data, by the figures, by the tables, whatever. That's probably one of the most common reasons. I mean, uh, manuscripts that are coming from a variety of other countries where English isn't the first language, there are other reasons. There may be English usage problems, there could be style, there could be formatting issues. But I think the main, one of the main reasons for sure is that um, someone's trying to make a big deal out of something that's not quite a big deal or something's not novel enough to be published. In, in so the- why do you think that that's an interest? I never would have thought that would be uh, the reason. And, and why do you think that is? You think that they're try- they start with a conclusion before they even do the science or you think that they don't understand science or they don't understand statistics? Why do you think people do that? That well, seems I odd to me. It's, it's a good question. I think everybody likes to think that their contribution to the academic literature is outstanding and is likely going to lead to 
new changes in the way that we take care of patients or the way that we do surgery and so on. But the reality is um, that isn't the case. I mean, you really have to prove something rigorously, whether it's through some kind of randomized uh, controlled uh, clinical process or by very carefully uh, stepwise um, showing that you've got something that's, um, that has nev never been done before, never been seen before, uh, before it uh, hits the press. So those are the main reasons why there are challenges uh, getting your work published. You know, a quote from one of my favorite authors, Robert Heinlein, he, he said, never ascribe to malevolence what you can ascribe to incompetence. So as, as the head of a prominent journal, I'm certain that when you review these papers and as you say, perhaps most commonly, the conclusions don't fit the data, um, more often than not, or perhaps most often, I would assume it's just a matter of overexcitation at the findings or perhaps an attempt to, to aim very high for publication. But how often in your experience uh, heading this journal have you truly suspected maybe these people are trying to slip something in knowing um, that what they're stating doesn't reflect the findings? And, and what's the journal's internal process for that? Yeah, thanks, JP. I mean, I, I think it's not malevolence. I don't think that they're trying to slip something past us. So right. We're pretty good at detecting things like fraud and scientific misconduct, but we'll get to that, I'm sure, in a moment. But rather, I think it's embellishing, right? It's just trying to make more out of yeah. what you have, right? Because we all think that what we've discovered, what we think we've discovered, is novel and new. But boy, when you look back, um, very few things are new under the sun, as I'm sure you know. Yeah, so, so I was going to bring up the issue of plagiarism, right? And, and that's, it's a very complex arena now and what that really means. Can you tell us a little bit about what, what, your, uh, what your policies and what your methods sure. are? Sure. Uh, it's not up to the peer review panel. In other words, um, those serving on the editorial board, and Mike, you've served on JNS Spine, so you know. It's not up to you on the editorial board as a reviewer to detect um, plagiarism. It's, it's rather left up to the um, publication office and our staff that run a search, and there are a number of search engines that can be used to identify where plagiarism exists. Interestingly, you know what? The Google search nowadays is just about as good as anything out there. You just type <laughs> yeah. in like a, a paragraph from an article, and if there's a duplication, it'll be found in a nanosecond. So it's kind of hard to hide, uh, but we do run. For those um, manuscripts that have gone through the first passage, they've gone through initial review, and they're about to go back to the authors for revision, at that juncture for the journal, that's when we do our necessary search engine um, check to see if these uh, manuscripts have been subject to any kind of duplication, fraud, uh, scientific misconduct, um, plagiarism. As Can I say. ask you something that's confused me for a long time about that? I get it about plagiarism, like, you know, people take other people's work, but can you plagiarize yourself? Sure, mm. it's called self-plagiarizing. And you know what? Um, I'm okay with it as long as you reference it. In other words, if you state something in a paragraph that is kind of word for word that what you published previously, I'm actually not too upset if the authors do that as long as they put the reference tag at the end of that sentence that this is where it's coming from. I don't get too bent out of shape. But if you do that repeatedly so that half the article turns out to be your stuff and you're self-citing, uh, that's not that's not cool. That's not a good thing. To so it, to explain that to me. Is it is it because a copyright between two journals or is it because... It's laziness, or is it because, like, to me, like, it's like, it's your work, right? So, like, I always thought plagiarism was taking somebody else's work. Well, was... and, and this has become a growing issue in many journals um, that, that at least I've, I've read in the news in the past few years because scientists struggle to communicate complex ideas in a succinct manner. They come up with a paragraph that actually communicates something well and directly and you can put hours into a good paragraph if you're a serious writer. And so it's an easy temptation to say, well, I, I already came up with how to say that. Yeah. So we flip the switch when there's uh, approximately 30% overlap between one manuscript mm. and another. So that's a lot of overlap. And if that's the case, if there's 30% overlap, then we respectfully ask the authors, even if it's self-citation that they're doing or self-referencing or, or plagiarizing, to go back and reword some of these uh, paragraphs because we, we just think that that's not uh, right to, to basically borrow and, and steal from your previous journal articles and, and place mm. them in, in, in our journal article. It still kind of confuses me though because I think about like if you're a scientist and you say, okay, 
E equals MC squared, right? And how are you going to rewrite that in a different way? Because it's already, as, as JP said, that's already the way it's written, and it probably shouldn't be written any other way. But I, I kind of get it. I mean, I, I you give you you let the author know, look, this is just just make it a little bit more kosher, right? Exactly. And, and you know, the other thing is, how many different ways can you write the materials and methods for a, like a scientific paper? Like, yeah. you know, the the technology for doing a Western blot or for doing concussive model on the spinal cord or uh, doing a, um, you know, some sort of vascular model of aneurysm formation. I mean, those are already described. So why would you want to take the effort of rewording all of it when you can basically yeah. say, here's the model, it's been described before, here's the reference tag for it. But if you leave that out, then that's when we get really upset. I see, right? I yeah. see, yeah. So um, I remember when I was a third year resident, I think it was, at USC, and I had sent a paper into the White Journal. This is back in the day when you actually had to have the, the physical prints for the figures and all that. It was a long time ago. And I got this rejection back. And, um, you know, the reviewers, I mean, I'm harsh sometimes, right? And I, I put the thing in my drawer and I couldn't write for a year. And it was like, it was so dejecting to me because, you know, it's very personal. Rejecting someone's writing is very personal. What, what do you tell the people, you know, young folks out there? They're like, okay, I'm busy anyways. And then, you know, maybe they just give up on writing. or Maybe they would have been good scientists or good writers. What do you tell people? I'm sure you hear this all the time. Yeah, sure. And I've also received scathing reviews of either articles I've written or grants uh, that I've submitted. And when it comes back, it hurts. It hurts big time, just as it did to you. And it took you a while to get over it. It's, it's always certainly... reviewer number three, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't necessarily have to be. But, but look, this is what I do when I, I see some reviews coming forward. I actually read all the reviews, as you can imagine. And sometimes the comments are harsh. And if there's a way I can change the tone of the comments, and I'll do that on the reviewer's comments. I won't let them go in if they're saying, you know, this is the worst possible study why didn't the authors happen to cite my work in the literature? Oh yeah, that's, you know, a, that's yeah. a popular one. You know, yeah. Or um, you know, there, there are so many um, red flags, the interpretation of the data is completely wrong and so on. I mean, I, I, I'll change the wording, I'll mollify it, soften it to make the blow less um, hurtful to the authors. I don't think that, that serves any purposes. There's a way to be constructive in giving these types of um, feedbacks to the uh, there's in the ways that ways to be damaging, and what I try to do is not to do the former, not the latter. I mean, five thousand papers, manuscripts. That means thirty five hundred to four thousand <laughs> rejections, and not just all the authors. Like, how many papers have a single author now? Right? It's like that's a lot of people that <laughs> I'm sure they're like Jim Radka. You know, why won't you accept my work? You know, well, over the years, I can tell you, I've made lots of friends, but I made some enemies <laughs> from <laughs> sending out those rejection letters and people, you know, see me at these meetings. Uh, we're currently at the Congress meeting here in, uh, in San Francisco, so I'm sure I'll bump into some folks and I'll be asked, you know, about my manuscript. Why didn't you possibly, <laughs> you know, look at it this way? But look, you know, the other thing is, uh, if you have a real bone to pick with the decision that's made about your manuscript, and you can articulate it in a way that uh, makes it clear that the reviewer is missed the boat. And, and the review process is not perfect, and we can get back to that. But if you can reflect on ways that you, you know that uh, you can improve your manuscript plus the author's missed the boat, then look, I'll, I'll review the manuscript again. I'll send it out for review. And that's, uh, that's a good teaching point for all authors to consider. How frequently do authors request that? You know what? Surprisingly few, less yeah. than five percent. It's an intimidating thing to ask for. Yeah, but but as I said, the the process is not perfect, and so yeah. there are errors that are made, and uh, particularly with the way that the journal does its review process that Mike knows about, which is its sequential peer review. In other words, reviewer one goes to two, three, and then four in sequence, not simultaneous, which means that there's a chance that reviewer one could see, or what reviewer one will submit, and then uh, reviewers two and three will see prior comments if they wish to. Mm. And so that, that gives an element of, of uh, bias or that, the broken telephone effect, so that if, if reviewer one made a mistake, then it's possible reviewer two and three will make the same mistake. It almost never happens, but it can. And so I'm happy to review those manuscripts again. So as you know, Mike Apazzo, uh, who founded World Neurosurgery and, and ran the Red Journal for, for many, many years, 
years, uh, was one of my mentors, and he told me something when I was a resident. He goes, he goes, you'll know you made it when you have the first, uh, I'm sorry, the, the single author manuscript. And so I've written some of those papers, and it's like, you know, like it's really burying your soul out there. There's nothing to hide behind, right? And and I really like that concept. But can you speak to the issue of these sort of paper factory teams? Like it's like, okay, I'll put you on my paper, you put me on your paper, now we double our CV size. And this issue of the proliferation of authors, Roberto Harris talks about this all the time about being intellectually dishonest. I don't know if I'd go that far, but can, can you speak to that as an editor? Sure. So we have some policies that are in place to guard against um, a free-for-all in terms of numbers of authors that appear on a paper. The days of the single author manuscript are almost gone, Mike. I, can tell you. I think <laughs> I may have accepted one this year, and that's about it. But it, it's almost never. You let one days. by that was mine. Yeah, but not this I year. Yeah, well, I think last year or something. But it was it was is, a great manuscript. Is that because they aren't submitted, or They're if there's submitted. a single author, is that a red flag from your end? No, not at all. They're just if, not. If someone wants to submit and has a great idea for a manuscript, and it happens to be a solo effort, I'm all for it. Hmm. But it'll be scrutinized just like every other man's, but it's just rare to happen nowadays. But I think, Mike, what you're talking about is where you have dozens of authors, and this particularly occurs in science uh, communication, so for the big journals like Nature, Science, Science, uh, Translational Medicine, and so on, we have a pile on of authors. And I must say, I worry about the validity of having so many authors on a given manuscript. Uh, one of my colleagues back in Toronto, for example, publishes routinely in, in super high impact journals and uh, great science uh, but anybody who submits a, a tumor specimen to this individual to do the uh, characterization and the molecular biology studies is guaranteed authorship so is that enough for authorship you know, on mm. a paper um, I, I you know i sometimes wonder about that but on the other hand the science couldn't be done without the starting materials so there mm. is a, a quid pro quo there and i think it's it's possible that everyone deserves in that context, uh, authorship, as long as they get a chance to see that manuscript in the end, they make um, suggestions for, you know, um, how the manuscript appears, the, the language of it, and so on, and, and make, make sure that there is a, a definite contribution to it. But I, I do worry about numbers uh, for clinical journals like ours, uh, Journal of Neurosurgery. And so we have some policies in place that, that safeguards against, you know, dozens and dozens of authors appearing in the list of authorship. Jim, this has been very helpful. I hope that the young folks out there are listening and getting inspired and getting some good advice on how to get their science and, and clinical work published. Um, it, it's, it's really a pleasure to have you here, and, and thanks for you know, all of your service. I can't imagine what it's like to read the thousands and thousands of manuscripts every year. Well, thanks, Mike and JP, and keep sending your best stuff to us, right? The Journal of Neurosurgery. Yes, the Double ANS Journal. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank sir. you.